What is up, everyone? Welcome back to the Fitness Stuff for Normal People podcast. I'm Mariana. And I'm Tony. And the fitness industry, it's not not the best. Uh, kind of sucks. It's become something built on unrealistic expectations and aesthetics, really whatever can drive page views and clicks, directing attention away from what actually matters. So the bottom line is, for us, we're really not just trying to provide another fitness podcast, but completely change the fitness industry for the better by giving you guys the knowledge and tools so you have confidence in applying the best possible training and nutrition into your own lives and today we put together the top five nutrition rules to live by so these are rules that are aimed to equip you with scientifically backed practical guidelines where if followed it will make reaching whatever goal you have easier make you feel a lot better and even extend your lifespan so we did the hard stuff to make it simple for you so you're confident in navigating the insanely complex world of nutrition before we get into that, if you want to support us, the best way you could do so is by giving us a five-star review wherever you're listening. You can also go ahead and follow us on Spotify if you haven't already, so you can stay up to date on every new episode that we drop on Mondays. And if you want more after each episode, join us over on Premium for just five bucks a month, five dollars. That's it where you get a bonus episode every single Friday where we're answering your questions. You get access to all of our complete 12-week training programs with workout trackers and Google Sheets from our push-pull legs, full body routine, including our latest two with an upper-lower split with your choice of an emphasis on either upper body or lower with glute growth. You also get other sick perks like weekly Legion supplement giveaways, exclusive discounts to companies like Aura Ring, Merrick Health for high-end blood work, and so much more. Sign up for that if you want to check it out. It's down in the show notes below. And a quick shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, the sponsor of every Fitness Stuff podcast episode <laughs> since day one, Legion Athletics. You know we have and always will love them. I am I can't say always will. I'm not a never always guy. <laughs> they could turn evil, but at least that day has not come yet. 100% of their supplements are backed by a scientific review board of MDs, doctors, dietitians to make sure that you are getting the highest quality and most effective supplements possible. They're all third party tested. They even have a no questions asked money back guarantee. You can use the Legion link in the show notes down below or type in code FSPOD. That's FSPOD at checkout for 20% off your first order or double points every order after that. Do you ever have those days where you just forget words? Yeah, that's where I'm I do. At today. I do. I'm actually pretty Today's good. I had really good sleep last night. Maybe that's I was actually really sick this weekend. And you know what? Last week I was really foggy. I was just losing it when we were filming and I was getting sick. So now I'm She's over on that. A game, ladies and gentlemen. So watch <laughs> out. You're gonna have to carry me through this because I'm forgetting the dumbest of dumbest words. <laughs> so we got a list of five rules today. And mm -hmm. we're not just gonna give you five rules. We're going to explain what the heck they mean, why we're putting them in place, because we do our best to make complicated and complex topics as simple to understand as possible without discrediting any of the complexities of whatever we're talking about. Yeah. Right. I think we try and do that a pretty good job of explaining why, because mm -hmm. context is required for almost everything. But if you're not like us who are in the fitness and nutrition world, where that is our day job, where we're spending all Tuesday talking about just that in days before researching, putting together these plans for you guys, you shouldn't have to think that hard about yeah. stuff like this. You shouldn't have to spend days a week studying and looking at nutrition to figure out what's best for you. Yeah. So that's why we wanted to condense it down into these really five rules where if you can follow these, we, we really took apart what's important from a dietary perspective. What are the big boxes that you want to be checking off? And what are some rules in place that we can say, if you're doing that rule, you're pretty much guaranteed to check that box of whatever important factor there is, right? That's why we wanted to create this list. If you do these things, you will lose fat faster, build muscle better. You'll have more energy through the day. You'll have less fatigue. You're going to increase your lifespan, not even just your lifespan, but your health span, your mm -hmm. quality of life, how you feel and how you act during that life. These five things cover every major piece of nutrition. Yeah. And they're really, these are things, it's not like this isn't some 
diet program or something that it is Tony and I saying, if you are doing this, this is definitely going to happen to you. It, these are more so principles for eating to influence your health in a positive way that anyone could benefit from. Really, anyone could bring these into their lifestyle, benefit from, and do for the rest of their lives is essentially like to make just your eating habits better. Absolutely. And I do want you to notice if you're listening to this, these five rules, we're not saying don't eat X, Y, Mm -hmm. or Z. Notice that we're not putting restrictions on pretty much anything. If you're going to notice throughout the episode, which is a big telltale sign is if a certain rule book or guiding principles are a little restrictive in that way. Never eat this, take out carbs, stay away from sugar. You might not want to follow those rules, but that's what we're here today to explain is the why yeah. behind them. So let's kick it off with rule number one. Yes. What is that? So this is eat five different colors per day. And and five is like a it's a it's a North Star, right? Eat in color every single day. Don't just have if you look at your plate and you notice it's mostly all brown or it's mostly all green, which green is great, but That doesn't give you a variety, and a variety is important, and I'll tell you why. So different colored fruits and vegetables contain phytonutrients, and these are compounds that give plants their rich colors, their distinctive tastes and aromas, and different colors have different phytonutrients, different micronutrients, so your vitamins and minerals. So each vitamin and mineral, each color is going to provide a different health benefit. No one color is superior, but a balance of all of them is going to be important to make sure that you're eating, uh, meeting those micronutrient needs. And this can just, I mean, people say like, oh, it's important to eat the rainbow. That's not just some yeah, saying that, that like, oh, eat your fruits and vegetables. Out like, there. There's some real yeah. wide. To, yeah. I feel like this one more than anything is going to impact how you feel mm-hmm. the most. Yeah. Yeah. You want to feel freaking good. Yeah. But Fruit, Loops, bigger... Fruit Loops doesn't count, by the way. Fruit I'm going to tell you count. that Fruit Loops, that's all five in one meal, but that doesn't count. I, I, people underestimate, like, you don't really stop and think about the fact that vitamins and minerals all have a distinct role in the body pertaining to human health. They all have a distinct function. You, you know they're good for you, but you don't actually sit down to think about that. People don't think about it. There's uh, vitamins and minerals. They're good for you because yeah. there's a lot of them. But to think each individual one plays a very specific role yeah, is interesting. Yeah. And that's why this varied diet piece is important. Mm-hmm. It's so interesting to me because you see people who I think a lot of people would associate as the picture of health or the pinnacle of health is bodybuilders stepping on stage. But they're usually the most nutrient deprived individuals that you will see. And yeah. they have insane nutrient deficiencies after stage, which the lowest internal markers of health are post show when they usually look their best. Yep. And that's because they don't have a variety of food in their diet. They're pretty much limited to rice, chicken, maybe broccoli. Yep. Hardly any of these colors are in there. And even though most people would think, oh, chicken, rice, broccoli, isn't that healthy? They will be much more nutrient deficient than even the average American diet, who's not yeah. that great, but it still has a lot of variety. So you're getting, mm-hmm. I mean, there are countless vitamins and minerals And they're all spread through different foods. So a variety diet is almost as important as anything else when it comes to health. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's why I think it's so interesting about this. Yeah. And epidemiological research suggests that food patterns that include a variety of fruits and vegetables are associated with reduced risks of many chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, certain types of cancer. And 8 out of 10 people in the U.S. are falling short in virtually every color category of phytonutrients or of of vegetables. We do not in the U.S. meet our fruit and vegetable intake. So this is really... And is nuts though. Yeah. This is an easy way to get you to eat more fruits and vegetables. And if you're eating a variety, it's an easy way to make sure, you know, I'm getting the the smaller micronutrients that maybe I don't think about as much. But so these different colors, there's going to be some overlap there with certain colors having the same vitamins and minerals, but there are distinctions. So if you think about your red fruits and veggies, you're going to get your vitamin C, vitamin A, potassium, lycopene, which is an antioxidant, which helps reduce inflammation. And these are going to be powerful in reducing risk for diabetes and heart disease. 
It's not going to make, it's not going to reverse a diabetes or heart disease. It's not going to make you immune to it, but it's going to help reduce your risk of contracting that disease. So certain fruits and vegetables like strawberries, raspberries, tomatoes, apples, beets, grapes, red bell peppers, watermelon that can be on the, the red scale. So a lot more fruits here. You'll also see some overlap here with orange and yellow because they're kind of close to each other. Mm -hmm. But the biggest difference for these orange and yellow ones, yes, you'll see vitamin C and potassium as well. But beta carotene is where you're going to get that from your orange and yellow vegetables. Beta carotene converts to vitamin A within the body, which helps promote healthy vision and cell growth. Very, I don't know if you've ever heard That's when you were a kid, one. like eat your carrots for your eye health. There is so much truth to that because the role vitamin A plays in vision in eye health. You can't get a large well, quantity of that from brown vegetable, <laughs> so to say. And, well, I mean, even in cell growth, that's kind of important. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Just a yeah. little bit. <laughs> yeah. Just a little bit. Then you get into your greens, which I feel like those are talked about a lot, like eat your greens, I mean, greens powder, like people know green veggies are good for you. Why are they good for you? Green vegetables are super high in B vitamins, your energy vitamins, so to say calcium, vitamin K, vitamin E, and iron are like the biggest ones you'll see. Mm. Vitamin K is essential for blood and bone health. It's very important there. Fol folate is one of your B vitamins. It's especially important for pregnant and lactating women to help prevent congenital disabilities in the womb. Mm. It's important for development. And so these are going to be like your cruciferous vegetables like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, what other cru cruciferous vegetables are there? I, those are those are the biggest ones off the top of my head. Brussels sprouts um, are my favorite. I love Brussels sprouts. And greens are also, so you, then your greens are like spinach, kale. What are those collard greens, arugula? But greens are a highly bioavailable source of calcium and vitamin K1. Again, th those both of which are hugely important for bone health. So if you think of, of your greens, you can think of your bone health. I feel like a lot of people, when they think of greens, they're like, oh, my skin health or my hair yeah. or I don't know, my digestion, which, yeah, like if you are eating a whole foods diet, like you are going to see the benefits in a lot of areas over time. It's not going to be this drastic difference, but that's just a generalization of eating a whole foods diet. Greens, like at when you look at them and actually what they are doing, the biggest component you're going to see is in your bone health, in your joint health. A lot of people don't don't think about. No, that, I don't so. think I didn't. I, I, I you kind of you, you know those things that you know but you don't like immediately think of. Like you hear it, and you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense, but you don't. Yeah, yeah how like, often when the... I associate greens, I never first think of bone and joint health. Yeah, which is yeah. crazy. Mm -hmm. Which for greens too, because here's where I'm going to take it is because I was a very picky kid and I wouldn't say I'm the least picky person ever now, but I don't think I'm too, too picky, but especially when it comes to fruits and vegetables, I definitely tend to swing towards fruits mm -hmm. more than vegetables. They're sweet. I think most of them are yummy. They're delicious compared to some of the vegetables. Would a kiwi be under the green side of things? Would it have a lot of these same benefits like a kiwi fruit, the sweeter side, then these green veggies that we're talking about, the broccolis, the artichokes. I, I'm, I'm guessing not even close to the same exact thing. Yeah. But would that count if I'm looking for green on my plate, looking for a kiwi? Kiwi, so no. Kiwi is going to be, it's going to have smaller amounts, but kiwi is going to be the biggest thing you're going to get from a kiwi is potassium and vitamin C. So I feel like that's a little bit of a, because you have your yellow kiwis too. It's super light mm. green. So you want to look for these dark greens for the, the highest amount of calcium and vitamin K. That um, is cool that the color legitimately is kind of a telltale sign of things. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And do kiwis, they grow on a tree, right? I think every fruit grows on a tree. Isn't that what makes it a fruit? Yeah. So so there's something to do with oh, the actual roots growth in the, in the soil and like mm. the nutrients from, yeah. So Okay. Um, Just a question though, because I'm like, okay, green. Yeah. But you're right. Even the greenest <laughs> kiwi is still very, very light green in comparison yeah. to some of the others. Yeah. I'll keep putting spinach in my smoothie. But if, yeah, if you're picky, you don't want those greens, like blend it into your smoothie. You can blend it into, a, get a jar of pasta sauce, put it in the blender with some spinach. Like you, you won't taste it. So that's the biggest hack for me where I struggle the most is these green leafy vegetables. Mm -hmm. I just put it in a smoothie. If I blend it up with a ton of fruit that's sweet, yeah. it, I'll tell you, I'm going to be a heads up. If you do this, it's going to look disgusting. It's going yeah, to turn it, the whole shape green. You do not taste it. You could do a blind taste test with 
a banana, strawberry, blackberry smoothie, one with spinach, one without blind taste test. You're not going to tell the difference. Yeah. They're going to look a heck of a lot different, (laughs) which for me was scary. But Mm -hmm. if you have a hard time doing that stuff, shove it in and dress it up. Instead mm-hmm. of just because eating just straight up spinach or broccoli, a lot of people aren't going See, to. See, I anyway. love roasted vegetables. So, like roasted asparagus, mm-hmm. roasted broccoli, green beans. With broccoli and green beans, roast them up. Like, okay, this is just the foodie in me, but so easy. Ro- roast them in the oven, spray them with olive oil cooking spray, add any seasoning you want, like to spice the them up. Seasoning is a hack. Yeah. And do just a little sprinkle of Parmesan cheese. It's so simple. It is going to make them taste so much better. I mean, it's Parmesan cheese. I'm not saying load your veggies with it, but just a a little dusting of it. And it's going to get a little bit brown and like crusty on top. It's really good, especially with green beans and asparagus. So that's also a hack I give for kids. And my sister, especially now that I am an aunt, I, with certain veggies, a little bit of Parmesan cheese goes Mm. such a long way. with Parm cheese or those little, you ever try the flavor God seasonings? No, but I like... Is it Lorraine's? Is that what it is? I'm not familiar with Lorraine's. I just know Flavor God because they have the most insane flavors. Oh, I, I've I've, I've never had them, but I know what you're talking about. Like yeah. they'll even have like chocolate donut seasoning. Yeah. Coke. Oh my gosh, Flavor God <laughs> saves my life. Sometimes. Sorry, so, sorry for the derail, but no, the, you have a hard it, time getting your greens. Mm-hmm. There's some ways to dress it up. Yeah. So greens, and then you also get your blues and your purples. So these have powerful antioxidants like resveratrol. I'm not going to try and say the other one, but these are specific antioxidants to blue and purple fruits and veggies, and they help block the formation of blood clots in the body. They also help reduce inflammation in the body. So that's for reducing the risk of diseases like diabetes and heart disease. So you, these are, you could get these from fruits. So if you're a picky eater, like there's a lot of options here. So especially blueberries, blueberries are so high in antioxidants, very, very good for you. Blackberries, also purple grapes. Raisins, even though I don't like raisins, but certain dried fruits can meet this. You just with dry fruits, you want to watch out because they're going to be significantly higher in in calories just because you're taking out all of the water and they're not that filling. But figs and prunes, super high in fiber as well, really good for you, but a lot of people don't like the taste of them. But there's a lot of options there to make sure you're getting those in. Let me just add a quick little tidbit on resveratrol. I know a lot of people who drink wine will say that that's why wine is that's, quote unquote healthy, a glass no. of wine or two a day. It does contain resveratrol because it's in red grapes and purple grapes. That is true. I, I remember looking this up because my sister is a sommelier, big wine. So if I'm ever at the grocery store, like I need wine for something, I'll just FaceTime her and be like, yo, tell me what to get. Genius. Works really well. But resveratrol in one glass of wine, it's- a red glass of wine, you're going to get anywhere from, I think it was 0.2 to five milligrams in one glass. That's it, 0.2 to five milligrams. The clinically effective dose when you're taking like supplemental form of resveratrol to notice any of these differences is around 500 milligrams per day. Yeah. So people will say that it's like the negative effects brought on by alcohol outweigh the positives of what resveratrol is by a hundred to one, by a hundred to one. Like it's just alcohol. Yeah, it, that always cracks me up because that's where people are. Oh, a glass of wine mm-hmm. a day is good for you. Yeah, My yeah, God. and then lastly, you also have your like white and brown categories. So these are onions specifically. They contain this nutrient called allicin, and it actually is not spelled allicin. It might be pronounced differently, but whatever. It's most known for having. I'm going to say this carefully, but anti-tumor properties. Okay. What does that mean? It, it In a lab, in a Petri dish, you may look at it directly having these anti-tumor properties, but it's just a really, again, I'm going to throw out this word antioxidant. It's just a very potent antioxidant, which mm. antioxidants just help reduce overall inflammation in the body. And it's a different type of antioxidant that you can't get from any of the other colors. And it's good for you. It, it, but it's not something that's going to like rid your body of tumors at all. But that's that type of language is where so many foods get this yeah. like powerful, crazy superfood that cures diseases. It's like, no, like <laughs> the way we're consuming it in our diet, like it's not going to be that powerful, powerful. But overall, as a whole, if you're eating a diet with a variety of these different types of fruits and veggies, like it's going to help reduce inflammation, but it's not going to kill your tumors. Okay. I have a question for you because this is out of all of the rules that we're going to talk about today, this might be one of the most challenging, I feel like, for people. Forgetting naturally five different colors 
in their diet. And here's something that I used to struggle with too, is if I'm prepping meals on the go, one thing that's really game changed for me is having a daily smoothie where I can blend up a lot of different colors, some mm-hmm. blackberries, some strawberries, put some spinach in there. I'm getting some banana. So I'm getting some yellow, some red, some yeah. green, some purple, dark blue, things like that in there. Is that a pretty, I mean, I feel like that's almost a little bit of a hack because that's kind of getting a lot of this stuff all in one instead of having to worry about where you can fit all of these different foods into different plates throughout your day. Yeah. That's That's what what saved me. Yeah. That's why that's like one of the best things about a smoothie. I'll always say it's an easy way to get a lot of micronutrients and also like, I wanted to make sure it can seem intimidating this five different colors a day. But if you break it down, say, I mean, not everyone, but maybe say the average person eats three larger meals per day. If you just focus on breakfast, lunch, and dinner, having a different color, fruit or veggie, you are, that's three right there. That's three colors right there. And maybe you are having a sweet potato and green beans at dinner. Like then that's two in one meal. So we're already at four. And then your snack, a different color. Like, Or if you just have like a bowl of berries, you get strawberries, blackberries. Yeah. Banana, yeah, it, fruit bowl, boom, you got a couple right there. It may seem, if you think about it, like I'm not talking about having five different colors on your plate at a time. No, we're talking about like in your whole day because this is an overtime piece. It's not like a just because I'm eating more color, automatically I'm healthier than you. It's no, it's just like over time, that's going to be beneficial for your health. You don't have to go freaking crazy with it. But and in doing so, you're going to get these trickle effects of helping you meet other rules that we're going to talk about. But by eating a variety of colors, what are you doing? You're eating more whole foods, which is overall good for your, good for your diet, good for your health. It's just improving your eating pattern in a way that's realistic. And it's not like we're telling you to take anything away. We're not telling you to do anything super strict. It's just a guideline that you could take with you throughout. Just check off a little box for just trying to eat a little bit healthier. So that's rule number one. Absolutely. So I think because that's a big one where I think this rule essentially is what I think what most people want a multivitamin supplement to be, even yeah. though we know that powdered vitamins are nowhere close to the same thing as the complex nutrition properties that whole foods do have. Mm-hmm. Think of it like that. If you can follow that one rule, just getting five different colors per day, the wide variety of different nutrients you're getting. I mean, we talked about that micronutrient deficiency episode. The top, I think is five or 10 micronutrient deficiencies people see like vitamins mm-hmm. and minerals and how you want to see that is you track all your food in an app like chronometer, which is a phenomenal app at looking at your micronutrient density and all of those nutrients, like Mariana said in the beginning, play a very specific role. So there are countless nutrients you have to be taking in. It's a lot easier to just check this box off eating five different colors and odds are you're probably going to fill up a lot or most, if not all of those nutrients that you need throughout the day. Mm -hmm. And that's why that's one of the rules that we put in for today, Mm -hmm. right? From a feel better perspective, you're going to feel great. You're going to live longer. That's a big one. That's a big one. Now, rule number two that we're going to put into place is I think the most important guardrail when we come now to composition goals, Right. I think this will make you feel better, live longer. Yes. But this is more directly tied to body composition, having a healthy body fat percentage through life, holding and building lean body mass. And it's something that we've talked about before, but we want to reiterate here and why it's a rule and how we can kind of set it around. And that is to structure each meal through your day around a protein source. So start protein, build out from there. Mm -hmm. That's the rule. If you want to put another rule in place, if it's easier, set a protein goal per meal and just have that be your thing. 30 grams of protein per meal minimum. That's it. It doesn't matter what else is on my plate. I need at least 30 grams. Let's start there. And this is important as you go through life. And maybe you're not the person with a direct body composition goal right now. You're not cutting or bulking like a lot of this podcast is that we talk about, which is a lot of people. They're eating to be healthier, to live longer, to just improve the way they look overall, but they're not hardcore cutting or bulking, right? They don't have a dedicated protein goal. One thing that protein does better than pretty much anything else is it inadvertently causes you to eat less food. So over time as weight gain usually sneaks up on people, this is one of the biggest things that can prevent that from happening. It's that guardrail conversation that we had around the holidays. I think is when we introduce that conversation of 
the guardrails, they're not there to maybe not scratch your car as you're going up the mountain. They're there to prevent you from falling into danger, from falling off the cliff, to keep you going in the right direction. Even though it might not be the perfect absolute thing, if you're hitting protein for each meal and building it around there, it's going to be really, really hard for you to gain significant amount of body fat or to fall off your progress. So when we talk about this, I don't think people realize how much of a difference this can be. And when I talk about different strategies nutritionally, I'll use for clients. A lot of the time, if a goal is weight loss, one of the first goals I will set for a client is to ignore calories, but focus just on a protein goal. Because one, that's a lot easier to focus on just nailing a protein goal than to count every single calorie in food, because we know that's a whole nother language on its own. Because increasing and hitting a protein goal will inadvertently cause you to eat less. And you might say, well, how much less? And I brought up this study before from Maastricht University, where they split participants into three different groups. And they didn't give these groups goals to lose weight. They didn't give any other dietary goals or guidelines. The only difference between the three groups is that one group was only eating 5% of their total daily food from protein. One was eating 15% of their daily food from protein and one 30% from protein. Meaning who cares how much you eat, don't set a calorie goal, but those are your three protein guides. Okay, zero instruction other than that. And they just observed what changed in calorie intake between the groups and they noticed something. The groups who ate five and 15%, so the lower protein groups, averaged about 2,300 calories per day of intake, 2,300 calories per day. The group who was eating 30%, so almost a third of their total food from protein, their total calorie intake without trying was 1,700 calories per day. That's almost 600 calories less every single day. Do you realize how much that can add mm -hmm. up over time? That, that's a pound a week in weight loss if you add it up like that. Yeah. A pound a week, you could either be losing or gaining weight, and they're not paying attention to anything else. They're not tracking their calories. They're not doing a thing. They just naturally aren't that hungry because mm -hmm. protein fills you up. It slows down your digestion. It influences your literal hunger hormones right? You're, it's fighting, you're helping your biology to help you eat less. It's also going to, I mean, do a couple other things like stabilize your mood, help with your fatigue, especially with your, if you're in a calorie deficit or losing weight. I mean, whenever I go through a weight loss phase, the first few weeks I'm good, but after about week four, my fatigue starts to set in through the day. Do you notice that? Like by about one, one o'clock, I'm just gassed mm -hmm. no matter how much caffeine I have or anything else. And keeping a high protein diet can help with that. So especially if you're dieting, but really if you're just looking to live longer, not put on weight, but also not be obsessed with your nutrition, this is one of the most powerful guidelines I think you could put in place. Yeah. Is either build it around protein or set a protein goal for each meal, 30 grams, 40 grams, 50 grams, depending on whatever your goal might be. And that's one of the easiest ways to knock it off and not have to pay attention to everything else. I know we don't shut up about protein. We should make AI count. What's the most commonly used words that we use? I bet protein would be in the top 10. Uh, oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Like other than just like little pronouns, like I, she, whatever, protein would have to be up there, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. So we're not going to beat a dead horse, but that's rule number two for today and why it's so freaking important. Mm -hmm. Rule number three, what do we got? To meet your recommended daily fiber intake. So- this is something that the majority of Americans fall short on is fiber. And it is such a lot of the reason being is because where do you find fiber? Whole foods, fruits and vegetables, whole grains, foods that are typically more, ex more expensive, less accessible, and not a part of the standard American diet. But it's single-handedly eating fiber is one of the best things you could do for your health. The all of the research points, points towards increased fiber consumption, reducing the risk of coronary heart disease, type 2 diabetes, several types of cancer, and all-cause mortality. There is nothing I will recommend more over and over and over again to people is make sure they are getting enough fiber when it comes to a health from, from a health when it comes from a health standpoint. Also, though, similarly, it can play a role in in weight maintenance if you have weight loss goals, which I'll get into mm. in a bit. But I typically will say it's going to be, it's like, I think it's, is it 25? It's 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day for men. Typically I say for everyone, the range 25 to 35 
grams of fiber per day is going to be what you could reach for. Because men might be on the higher more, side, women on the lower like, side. The more updated version I've been seeing is about aiming for 14 grams of fiber for every 1,000 calories you eat is a good way to put it. Because if you're eating a lot, eating a little, that's where I know Lane was doing a deep dive on it the other day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is a good way to kind of put it up. But that's even confusing enough as it is sometimes. Yeah. Amy, and that's going to put you right between what Mariana just said, mm -hmm. 25 to 35 grams. Yeah. So yeah. if you make that the rule, you're not going to be far off from yeah. the health benefits. And before I get into why, make sure you understand your starting point. Because I'm not saying to just jump all of a sudden, start eating 25 grams of fiber per day if you're only eating five or if you're only eating 10. Track for, for a week, track your calories in like a chronometer in a MyFitnessPal because it'll tell you your fiber intake and look at your average daily fiber intake. And each week, increase your fiber by around five grams. If you think you can do 10, do 10. Five is pretty conservative, but it's going to, one, be less daunting. If you're just, okay, this week I'm going to go from 10 grams of fiber per day to 15 versus 10 grams of fiber per day to 25. It's just going to be less daunting. And it's also going to put less strain on your digestive system. I was going to say, you're not even talking about, that could yeah. F you up if you just Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's before I say this, like, I want to say that at the beginning, if someone stops listening, it's just like, okay, 25 grams of fiber per day. I want you to, to make sure that you know your starting point first because of the role it plays in digestion. So dietary fiber is the edible part of a plant um, or similar carbohydrate that are resistant to digestion and absorption in the small intestine. They're actually digested by the microbes in your large intestine. We do not digest fiber, which I just think is so cool. It's so interesting. It's and it is has the potential. So from a health standpoint, like dietary fiber can change the gut microbiota and alter metabolic regulation in humans due to these byproducts that the microbes in our gut produce from digesting fiber. So they produce these sh short chain fatty acids, which are very, very, very beneficial to our overall health and also your overall gut health. Not really going to get too far into the nitty gritty there, but that's a little bit more in, into why they produce these beneficial compounds for overall health. And that's why I mean the gut is so uh, gut health. It, it has a reason for being so popular and trendy and it's just the research coming out is insane, but we're not really at that level yet of being able to do large human studies because it is so complex, but it's so fascinating. Like gut microbes are so fascinating. You have different, two different types of fiber. You have soluble fiber which actually attracts water and turns it into this gel-like consistency during digestion. And this slows digestion. And this is going to really help with keeping you fuller longer, helping you stop eating maybe a little bit earlier after a meal. That's where it's going to play an in this indirect role in weight, like weight loss or weight maintenance, kind of like protein. And it's found in like oats, nuts and seeds, beans, lentils, apples, pears, sweet potatoes. You get some crossover with the other type of fiber. So the second type of fiber is insoluble fiber. And this is in foods like vegetables that are not as dark in color. So think of like your celery and your cucumber, mm. certain whole grains too as well. But this actually adds bulk to the stool and helps food pass more quickly through your stomach and, and intestines. So think of it having it's not going to have it, it's not really going to have a laxative effect but it's going to help mm. move things along quicker. It's not going to have that as much of a satiety effect as soluble fiber. But where this can be really helpful for weight loss and weight maintenance is that satiety effect. It's going to increase satiety, increase satiation, keep you fuller longer. It's also going to help you after you eat a meal. It's it's going to prolong the time to your next meal. So not only are you going to feel full and satisfied and be able to like put your fork down and be like, oh, like this was a really satisfying meal. I don't want to reach for anything else. It's also going to de delay that time between having one meal and the next. So, so I don't know if you've ever had like lunch and then 20 minutes later, you're like, fuck, yeah. I'm hungry again. <laughs> one thing I've noticed with fiber, because I will have to say, I got to attribute this to Mariana 100%. I wasn't super concerned about fiber until we, like before the podcast several years ago. I just didn't pay much attention. I knew mm -hmm. it was important. But until we had the initial fiber episode forever ago, mm -hmm. I can't understand like how much better I feel when paying attention to this goal. And one thing that's interesting to me is protein, I feel like has a satiating effect. It fills me it up. Does. Mm -hmm. 
But for some reason, and I don't know if it's also because of the foods that I'm getting my fiber through, but like a bowl of like blackberries and raspberries or something like that. I feel like that makes me feel less of like a craving for food afterwards where I could eat a high protein meal for dinner and be stuffed, but I still have like a little chocolate sweet tooth or Mm -hmm. something like that. And I notice for some reason, and it could be not the fiber, it could be, but whenever I specifically add fiber to the meal, I don't have that craving of like wanting more of that food either. I don't know if that's completely coincidental Mm -hmm. or not. Is there anything to do with that? Is it something with the gut No, there is. So that's that kind of fine line between the difference in satiation and satiety. So both protein and fiber are going to be high on the satiety index. You're going to feel full. You're going to feel like, okay, like this is feeling, it's satisfying, but the satiation is that one, it's like the difference. It's how long you feel satisfied, but it also targets that cravings piece. So which is hard for a lot of people. Yeah. So fiber definitely does that. And then I also think there's the, this is just my thoughts now, right? Of not like looking at the data and the actual reason, like known specific Mm -hmm. reason. But I think there is a level of with certain high fiber fruits, uh, you also can get a lot of sugar. So like natural sugar, like in fruits and berries, apples, apples are super, super satisfying. Not only because, you know, they increase stomach distension. So like you feel them in your stomach, like you you get that signal to your brain that there's food in there. There are a lot of fiber, but they're also super sweet. So they can satisfy that sweet tooth a little bit. Same with berries. They can satisfy the sweet tooth a little bit more, even things Mm. like sweet potatoes. You're not going to think like, oh, this is the same as chocolate, but it does have that carbohydrate aspect to it. So that's when I'm just getting the wheels turning of like a lot of high fiber foods are also high carb foods. So like a lot of veggies, lots of carbs, which can help be a little yeah. bit more satisfying. Because I'm like, don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm eating chocolate. I'm not the person who's like, oh, eating berries is this, like it, it does. No, no. Not at all. But it's just that it's weird. It's like that feeling for wanting more. I use chocolate for an example, just because that's my sweet tooth, my craving. Mm-hmm. That just goes away. It's hard to explain. It just kind of goes away. Yeah. It's not like I feel like I just ate chocolate. It's just that I don't have the want for it anymore. Yeah. It's weird. And I think it's because you've satisfied that, like, especially if people who lean more towards, you know, wanting sh- something sugary after a meal or more carby people like you've also satisfied that carbohydrate craving in a different way it's not going to be the same like sometimes if you just want chocolate you want chocolate but that is that's going to be a huge piece to it like a lot of people again i don't want people to take this the wrong way and think it's like a disordered process because it's it's not that deep but a lot of people who feel like their cravings are out of control and they don't know like they can't stop having sweets are the same people who restrict carbs. And it's, it might not be that you're craving all the sugar. You might just need more carbs in your diet. True. Yeah. So That's big. But it sounds lame because it doesn't have any direct impact on like body composition. But I just notice when I can fill my day with enough fiber, it's like I just feel better. I feel more energized. I see less bloating. I just feel like my body composition change happens quicker. Mm-hmm. When I'm eating a lot of fiber it, and just smoother, I don't know why. It, that's one of my favorite new things in this past year, year and a half is obsessing over fiber because it's not as sexy or cool to talk about as protein, no. anything else. And it's harder. No one accidentally gets enough fiber in their day without paying attention to it. Like you have to be intentional about it. Yeah. You have to I be remember intentional about your meals. talking to you. I was looking up the data on what the average daily intake was for most Americans. And it said like 15 or 16 grams was average. And I challenge that a little bit because almost every client I've ever worked with, and we start paying attention to food if that's what we're doing, it's not uncommon to see daily fiber intake of like three to nine grams yeah, total it's throughout the entire, yeah. it's not uncommon to see that. Mm-hmm. 15 is like, oh dang, it's more rare than someone in the single digits. Yeah. So that yeah. surprised me when it said the average American intake was 15 a day. Cause I know the average American diet's not that good. Yeah. And if you're stressed about this, I mean, that's why we, I put the eat five different colors per day. First, if you are focusing on eating a variety of colors, you're also going to be unintentionally getting in more fiber. It's oh, yeah. not going to be the complete answer automatically because I am eating more color. I'm going to be getting fiber, but it's going to help get you there. Uh, it, so yeah. If you're eating a ton of berries, all this, it's kind of hard to not hit it. Yeah. Yeah. Rule number four. I mean, even though if I, t- I'm going to be honest, if you've done one through three up to this point, you're living uh, a pretty good I, life. 
Yeah. What? Yeah. You're living a pretty good life. You're, I also feel like we just life. talked about this like a yeah. little bit, but yeah. a little bit, but not really. Rule number four. Rule number four. And this one I think is more just to how to navigate nutritional advice or if you're ever yes. choosing something through the rest of your life. This is where rule number four applies. And that is to not take anything away from your diet. Instead, see what you can add into it. And I know this sounds cliche and stupid and blah, 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 but it would blow my mind how many questions I get, and I'm sure you get through the day too, of how many of those would just disappear if, is if you just followed this rule. If you just followed this rule, don't take away from your diet when you're trying to make changes. See what you can add in. Add, Meaning, don't subtract. It's this idea subtract. of clean eating, This the, the food should be off limit. I mean, think of this, which... The idea of clean eating, and no matter how many times I can preach to my followers to, that it's it's pointless and it's meaningless, it's this thought almost of that there is there's knowledge that changes behavior, and there's knowledge that doesn't. Yeah, I think a lot of people when you explain them like there's really no such thing as a clean or dirty food, and like eating clean doesn't mean they're like yeah I know that, but then that same person a week later will come up to you and you're like you know what I'm not losing weight I'm eating clean what am I doing wrong, <laughs> and it's like didn't what did you just say. You know, and I think that's where this rule comes into a clan. This idea of clean eating, which let's break this down real quick, is simply labeling foods as either clean or dirty and then eating the clean and not eating the dirty, right? That's essentially what it is. And why we're saying this is just the most illogical, I don't even like to use the word stupid, but just stupid or lazy approach I've ever heard of and most people don't get it is, is this. Think about it. If you ask the shirtless guy on aisle seven in the grocery store, carnivore MD, our favorite. I swear to God, if I ever came into con, I don't know what I would do. I would probably get arrested. I think it'd be fun. I think you could mess with him. I think I'd love to mess with him and just make his life a little bit harder while he's trying to film a video with his shirt off. That's besides the point. But it, it, I mean, think about it. Every person's definition of what's clean and dirty is going to be different. If you ask carnivore MD, what foods are clean and dirty or which side of the list <laughs> foods are on? He's going to tell you that pretty much meat is clean and plants are dirty and should be avoided. Any plant food, avoid it. Meat, eat it all day. And then you ask someone from a more plant-based or vegan background, and they're going to tell you almost the opposite. Plants, any plant-based food, good, clean. Any animal-based food, meat, animal product is dirty or bad. doesn't matter if it's a plant-based chocolate bar potato chips, as long as it's plant-based, it's clean. And then let's say you just ask your friend who maybe lost some good weight using the keto diet. They're going to say you that fats are clean and carbs are dirty. A stick of butter, great. A banana, you're going to hell, right? So the basis of all this is if you eat clean according to each person's definition or each group's definition of what clean is, you'd have an empty plate. You'd have nothing left. And that is the biggest flaw with this style of eating is I'm eating clean. I think that's a lazy excuse people use when they're like, I'm trying everything I can. I'm just not working. I'm eating clean. That doesn't mean anything. I think that's comforting to tell yourself, like, I'm trying. No, you're not. Because there isn't one definition for what clean is. Okay? We know calories in versus calories out is going to determine your weight gain or loss always. Always. You can gain weight eating plant-based. You can lose weight eating Twinkies. Okay. Ask, we talked about that a long time ago. Professor Mark Hobbs, literally the Twinkie diet where he lost 27 pounds eating nothing but gas station food and Twinkies. He's a professor of human nutrition at Kansas state. You can look that up. Your diet as a whole can be healthy or unhealthy, but not one single food. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking to add more good in, right, you only have so much space that can make up your diet, so much effort, so much energy that can make up what you put in your body. If you're focused on adding the good stuff, it naturally works the stuff that's less conducive to your health out. If you're eating, like we talked about, a lot of protein, if you're eating a high fiber goal, if you're just doing those two things alone, there's not going to be a massive amount of room left for things that might be more detrimental to your health, like McDonald's or French fries. Again, that can fit in a healthy diet. And I know people are going to be like, oh, how dare you say that? That can fit if it's a very small piece of it, not the entire thing. Okay. So when you eat and focus on the good things, the rules that we're talking about adding in the five colors, the fiber, the protein, 
all of your nutritional needs are going to be met. Who cares if you have a little Twix bar at the end of the day, it's not going to impact your health. So people who are, that don't eat seed oils, don't eat X, Y, or Z, it doesn't make any sense to take that approach yeah. because that does nothing of saying, well, okay, you could not eat seed oils, but still be deficient in all the things that we talked about today. Seed oils has nothing to do with whether or not you're hitting those marks. Mm -hmm. Right. And I feel like I like think about it with anything else in your life, how focusing on what not to do derails the fuck out of any process. Think of first, this might be most relatable for people thinking about lifting. If you're doing uh, a barbell back squat, how great would your performance be if the whole entire fucking time, all you're focusing on is not dropping the weight versus focusing on your form and prioritizing your form Seriously. or thinking about how much energy you could put into one more rep versus thinking about is the barbell back squat going to be the best for my glute growth the whole time? Should I be doing something else? It's not productive. And you can think about that with any, think about your job. If the whole entire time you're thinking about what not to fucking do, what you shouldn't be doing, how much more energy do you have to focus on what you should be doing and what you can be doing well, realistically? It applies everywhere. Yeah. I mean, because that's what we're talking, like the foundation of building your health. If you want to live longer, if you want to lose fat better, if you want to build more muscle, feel better, you have to fill up certain buckets in your diet, your fiber bucket, your protein. You have to fill all these vitamins and minerals. You have to fill them up. Focusing on what to avoid does nothing for filling up those buckets. Instead of no. if you just focused on filling them up, like you're saying, focus on filling them up you're just going to naturally notice that those things don't really have that much room. And that's not saying that you can't have them or shouldn't have them, but it's just such a, from a, from a mindset psychology standpoint, the odds of you succeeding doing that I, I, are a hundred to one compared to just yeah. focusing on what you can't have. Yeah. Because if you focus on what you can't have, there's not going to be a lot less and you're going to be miserable while doing it. It mm -hmm. doesn't work. It doesn't work. And it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And when you are applying these principles, you are starting to eat healthier, focus on more nutritional aspects of your diet. You're going to notice more what makes you feel good and what doesn't make you feel good. Let that inform what you do and, and, and don't eat. Don't let what someone else is telling you not to do or what you think you should be doing in terms of taking food away. Don't, don't let that inform you. You really, something like this isn't a rule, but it is a indirect benefit from following these principles is you really start to understand your body and how food impacts it. Like Tony was talking about with the fiber and that informs your decisions intuitively. You don't have to think about it. Your body is telling you, oh, this doesn't, this isn't working or wow, yeah. when I'm eating this much fiber a day, I feel so good. I want that more. So it's going to drive me to yeah. do that more. It yeah. blows my mind. Like that single approach. And that's where it drives me nuts too. Last piece on this is the contradictory part where I see generally the people who are telling you to eat clean, quote unquote, are also the same people you will see. It, it cracks me up when this is just so hypocritical and it's just in plain sight that the person themselves don't see it. Like the person who's like, just only put real food in your body or eat clean will post when they're eating out at like a pizza restaurant the next day and like promote like, oh, you gotta have balance, stuff like this. It's like, you can't be the person saying never eat X, Y, or Z, and then turn around and eat that the next day yeah. and say balance. You can't yeah. do that. <laughs> and you notice it's because that's just not how life works. No, Like that's not how, it doesn't seem like an enjoyable life and no, hardly anyone actually sticks to what they're preaching like that. Yeah. But even though that's, I feel like just where nutritional information comes from today is avoid this because it's going to kill you faster. It's going to make you fat. It's Not to mention this. it's such an orthorex orthorexic mindset. Orthorexia is like this obsession with eating perfectly, eating super clean all the time. That's an eating disorder. Like this is not offensive. This is not something that's like trigger warning. It's, no, like that obsession, feeling like you have to feel perfect, controlling every single food, like every single ingredient, worrying about it, fearing ingredients, thinking like if you're not eating clean, something bad's going to happen. Like th that's the pipeline. That's what happens. A lot of these people oh, are absolutely. preaching clean, clean, clean only they're fuck. There's a fucked up relationship with food there. That's not healthy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like <laughs> It's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. Um, so but... that's, I know it's cliche and it's weird, but that's why, because I know a lot of people, again, there's knowledge that changes behavior and there's knowledge that doesn't change behavior. 
Yeah. Hopefully that explanation helps change behavior because a lot of the same people who will say, yeah, I know I don't need to listen to this are the same people, I promise you, who are avoiding certain foods at the supermarket or avoiding certain foods when they go out because they have that rule ingrained in their head. Yeah. The same exact people. So I know it sounds cliche, but one of the most important things that you can do if you're looking forward in life. Now, rule number five, I want to keep saying that each rule is more important than the last rule, but they're not. Rule number five is what I think separates people who see long-term success and keep their success and those who don't. Yeah. And what's that? Rule number five. So number five is going to be to be intentional. So this is like planning, planning ahead, having some sort of idea of what I'm going to be eating this week. How am I going to, how am I going to meet these principles? Like, how am I going to make sure that I do that? Can't just go in blind. It's like my example that I always give is going to the grocery store without a fucking list. How successful is that? Is that ever successful? For most, maybe I'm just speaking from experience. Well, no, I'm like, I still try to do that every time and I f- fail nine times. Yeah, time. yeah. I'm an idiot. It, it, and like the power of a list, it's just a small plan to guide you, right? So that's just one example. But it is taking the extra time, the sm- taking advantage of the smaller moments to just think about, okay, how am I going to achieve this? What am I going to eat this week for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Let me outline my meals. I know I'm going to have a busy week, so I know that I need to meal prep lunch and dinner. What are those meals going to be? What do I need to get at the grocery store? How much time am I going to have to cook this week? How much do I need? To, how much time do I need to dedicate to meal prep? These are just all examples of being intentional, right? Thinking about that, being expecting when things are going to get tough and maybe plan A is not going to work out and you need to resort to plan B. Like there, it's just this intent that is going to make it so much easier to follow these other rules. I feel like giving examples is the easiest way to put it, right? Yeah. Well, because I'm even like, it doesn't, this seems like a big to do like, oh my God, that's exhausting. I got a family. I got kids. Like I don't need to spend extra time. We're not saying that you have to be intentional with every single action through your day. You need to be thinking about it. Mm -hmm. But the plan ahead piece, even I'm saying five minutes the night before or on a Sunday taking five or 10 minutes to just think ahead what's coming up in life Mm -hmm. can pay off so big. I used this example the first time we were talking about this in Aloe of what had happened to me a few nights before with the tacos. Remember that? How stupid and lazy I am is... One of my dinners lately that I just go to literally every single night is my turkey tacos. I get the 99% lean, 1% fat turkey meat. I have half a pound of that, chop it up, get my taco shells, my lettuce, super filling, super protein, checks my boxes for the day. And I love it, right? Helps me complete my goals every single night. And I'm usually tired at the end of a long day. A lot of meetings, we're recording all day, something like that. And this one night, I just realized that I forgot to buy more taco shells. I usually have five tacos. I only had two shells left. I had two shells left. So at the end of the day, it's like 6.30, 7 o'clock. I'm finally winding down, getting this stuff ready. I get everything out. I only have two taco shells. And it's something where you're like, this is a silly example. But at the end of your day, when your willpower is low, oh my God. I was like, gosh, I could either walk to the grocery store, which is literally a block away from me. doesn't require that much effort. But I was like, oh my God, like, I'm just tired. Let me just do this. I'm going to Uber Eats. I Uber Eats like a chicken sandwich totally messed up my calorie goal for the day, kind of got a little bit of protein, but I felt like crap and I missed it. It it took that little of an event, just missing three taco shells that I did not plan ahead for that completely threw me off for my day. Where if I was in like a hardcore deficit to lose fat, that would screw up my entire day is me just eating out like that. And it's because I didn't just take the time to think ahead of like, oh, do I need to buy extra tacos? Let me check. Oh yeah, I need some more shells. Let me pick that up at the grocery store. It's a few minutes of just thinking like, okay, where are some potential trap doors that might come through this week? Because guess what? You might have a great plan. It's not ever going to go exactly according to plan. Yeah. So just think what could throw you off? What I, could do these things? And it, it's unreal how just being that thought, you don't have to even do too much action. Thinking about it, knowing that's going to come can save your days. Yeah. Yeah. Like we all, like some, I always ask people like about you know, sometimes we'll be like, oh, like I just ended up ordering food or I had the food here. I didn't end up eating it. I got takeout or I went out to eat or I had just 
snacks instead. I always ask them, like, what are the patterns you see on these days? If this happens often, let's take advantage of that. We know if you know once a week, there's a night where you're like, I know I'm just going to be like, fuck it and want to eat whatever I want. Let's play into that a bit. So for example, me, I always know either Wednesday or Thursday for whatever reason, because I don't really eat out much at all. So I'll even cook on like Friday and Saturday nights, but just a halfway point, I know I'm going to be like, look in my fridge. I'm going to have it planned out. Even if I have a meal there ready to go, I know that I'm not going to want to cook. Like, it's just like, a, mm. I don't even want to bother. I don't want to microwave anything. And that might sound crazy. Like, it, oh, it's so simple if you have the food. Sometimes I just get burnt out. And that also might be because I cook during the day for my job. But I play into that and I'm like, oh, but I have these two meals, one from Chipotle and one from Sweet Green that I know the calories and macros for mm. them. And I could just go in, boom, place order when I, when that comes up. And I plan for that. Like, it's just, you know, and it's just playing it like that's still a plan, even if plan A doesn't go right. I know my plan B because that is that's just me yeah. as a human. I'm not perfect. Absolutely. Because um, how many times yeah. do people just it cracks me up too when I'm working with like clients or busy people because we're all busy. Shout out to my client, Ryan, who's actually having a baby this month. And he just had a bench press and squat PR. Hulk yeah. dad. But Ryan, I talked to him about this before about sharing this story was having a hard time at work. Cause he's got a super high stress job. He's a lawyer. And if you look at your week going forward, you can plan it out where you look at your schedule and you're like, Oh, this schedule looks good. I should be able to fit the meals I had planned in this little window each day. But week after week meetings would get sprung. Something would run over, something would move around and three out of the five days per week, that window that we had to eat what we had planned disappeared. Mm -hmm. It was gone. So you can have the best plan A, but look for those things and be realistic of like, okay, here's what's supposed to happen. Here's what I'm going to do. Just take a minute to think about it. Here's what I'm going to do if that doesn't happen, if something gets in the way of that. Where an example for him and I would be every time that would happen, it would be something quick that was just fast food right across the street. Uber eats it over here because it was quick. It was easy. And when you're stressed in that environment too, you're thinking about what do I want right now? We'll just get you know, rip the bandaid yeah. off, order some McDonald's and whatever, where we realized there was a shout out Chipotle, not a sponsor one day, maybe Chipotle right around the block. And Chipotle is super macro friendly where you can make it fit your goal. If you're trying to build muscle, lose fat, we're just taking the time ahead to say, Oh, if this happens where this little time gets sprung around and instead of an hour, I only have 20 minutes. I'm just going to run down to Chipotle, get this meal that I already know what I'm going to get bowl, white rice, double chicken hits my goal for the day. Just thinking about that beforehand, the Chipotle was always there. It was always there. But until we thought about it beforehand, it never was something that was in place. It's something that you have to think about before of not just what you're going to do, but what's going to happen when things go wrong, mm -hmm. because things will always go wrong. The more pieces you have in your life too, the more often they'll go wrong. Yeah, I got kids, more things are going to go wrong more often, busier job, more friends, whatever it might be. It's crazy. Just that little five minutes a night before your next day of just thinking, what am I doing for breakfast tomorrow? What am I doing for lunch? What am I doing for dinner? Make sure those pieces are in place. Mm -hmm. It's a big one. I know these all sound a cliche is what I'm thinking of at the end of this day, but if you do these things, you will lose fat faster, build muscle better. You'll have more energy through the day. You'll have less fatigue. You're going to increase your lifespan, not even just your lifespan, but your health span, your mm -hmm. quality of life, how you feel and how you act during that life, these five things cover every major piece of nutrition. So I'm like, I was super pumped at looking at this list that we put together here. But when you look at the rules, they almost seem a little cliche in a sense. But hopefully now they understand the why behind each one. It's like, if you can do all these five things, it's going to be hard for you to screw it up. Yeah. And you have may, may have heard me say, I say it often, dietary patterns. And I think Tony just said it on this episode, but dietary patterns are what influence health outcome, like how you are eating regularly, consistently over the months, over the years. That is what plays a role in your health. This is what we mean by dietary patterns. These rules that we gave you are promoting a healthy dietary pattern. It's not this black and white, eat this, eat that. It's not this specific diet. It's not that there's one way to do this. You can really change it based off of 
your life however is easiest for you to do it. There's going to be multiple different ways as part of your overall dietary pattern. That is what we mean when when we are talking about these dietary habits, dietary patterns. This is improving those habits and patterns. The more we put it around, like these don't sound like the most challenging. We're not asking you to do a freaking backflip. Eat five colors. Structure each meal around protein. Hit a moderate fiber goal. These aren't the biggest <laughs> asks of the world. I, I really think you would be shocked at just aiming for these things. Do this for a couple months and you'd be astounded by the change you see take place. Absolutely insane. So that wraps it up with our top five rules. Nutrition rules to live by. Get this tatted on our body. I got some new tattoos. (laughs) I feel like I bring that up. Give us a tattoo tour. (laughs) Wait, another one? No. Oh, I was like. No. No. I'm like, holy, what are you talking about? This was just last week. But like over the span of a month, I got five new tattoos. Like in a one month span. (laughs) Next time you see her, she's going to be like MGK, just blacked out. Did you see the new MGK tat? Blacked out? I have. I'll send it to you. That's going to be you. (laughs) minus one year. But for everyone on premium, we'll talk to y'all this Friday with our weekly AMA episode coming out. Give some Legion supplements away. Have a good time over there. To everybody else, we'll check you out next Monday for a fresh new episode. Talk to you soon.